Hello and welcome to Spooky Stitches, a knitting podcast that is 75% wool and 25% ghosts. My name is Sheena Perrell. I'm a knitting novelist and I will be your host for this lucky episode number 13. Uh, if you enjoy what you see here, please remember to like, subscribe, comment, share, whatever floats your boat. Um, and I hope that you stick around and join me for 30 minutes to an hour of knitting chat. <laughs> so since the last podcast I have been working, I started a new temp job pretty much right after I had filmed that. Um, it was going really well. It's in, on site, unfortunately, but the upside of it is that I have a lot of downtime. So I've been able to do things like knit and write while I'm working, which is fantastic. Um, that was not what I was expecting. And I'm hoping that they keep me on full time after my contract runs out. Um, you know, Friday, I usually get Fridays off and I actually drove down to Portland to take a kitty to his new home. Um, so we, <laughs> We lovingly say that we run the Cat Trap Hotel and Day Spa because we keep getting these injured stray cats that literally just walk up to our back door, knock, and ask to be let in. I swear Gwid has been sending out Twitter messages saying, you know, suckers live here, free food. So this was an orange boy. It was his second time coming to us. The first time we took him to the shelter and he was picked up the last minute by his people and then he showed up less than a month later looking even worse so we're like we're not doing that again he was checked for a microchip he didn't have one so we're like all right that's it we're not even going to try to find his humans because they're clearly not doing their due diligence with them he hadn't been treated for his previous injuries. He was underweight. He was dehydrated. Um, he was just in really bad shape. But I had a friend down in Southern California and she just fell in love with him on first sight. So we arranged what we call a kitten ball. It's basically a relay of drivers that takes stray cats or cats that need rehomed to their new loving families. So I was the first leg of that, drove down with him on Friday. It's three hours each way for me. The first three hours was fantastic. He just sat in my lap and he purred the whole time and he was making eyes at me and giving me the little paw of love. If you have a cat, you're familiar with this. Um, and it was just so hard to let him go, but I was covered in white and orange floof when I got home. <laughs> it was so bad. I had to change clothes as soon as I walked in the door. So that has been life in the last couple of weeks. Um, haven't been doing a whole lot else. I am trying a new treatment for my chronic illness that has really helped my energy levels. So that's a plus. Um, it's just right now things have really been in flux and shifting a lot. So I'm trying to get caught up on all the stuff that I couldn't do when I was exhausted, but also at the same time, trying not to overdo it and put myself back in that situation. Um, however, as I mentioned, I have been able to knit while I'm at work and I have been getting so much done, so much. <laughs> So you can see the first FO. This is the hat that I was working on last time. This is just my basic hat recipe, except that I did cables along the brim instead of just plain ribbing because I knew that the, uh, the cotton yarn wasn't going to stretch as much and I didn't want it to be too like floppy and everything. So I made that and I'm going to go ahead and leave it off because I'm quite warm in this top. Uh, second thing I finished, which is going to look pretty redundant. I made two pairs of identical gloves and the reason for this. Okay. So 
I'm not sure which one I made first, but I made one like this first. I was like, okay, I will just count my rows, make one that's identical to it. So I made one like this. However, if I hold them up against each other, you can see that one is longer than the other. And I don't know how that happened. I counted my rows so many times. So I went back, I still had more yarn. So now I have one pair in the longer size and one pair in the shorter size. And they're both fine. Like there's nothing functionally wrong with the shorter pair. It's just that um, when I'm wearing matching things, texturally, I like them to match. And the fact that the short one didn't cover as much, uh, didn't cover as much of my hands, that really bothered me. So, yeah. So here they are. And so now I have a long pair and a short pair. One of these lives in my work bag to replace a pair that used to live there, which Morrigan ate because Ash's cat is kind of a bitch. She just is. She's currently laying on the other side of my tripod, giving me side eye. So two pairs of fingerless gloves, and this is using the uh, Nipex Stroll in Coffee Shop and Coldstream. And this is like what I had started crocheting a bag out of a few weeks ago. Um, and I just tore it out and made these mitts. And I still have a little bit of each color left, but I don't know if I have enough to do anything with it. Remains to be seen. Oh, and this is a cotton bamboo mystery yarn. I lost the ball band as soon as I took it off the ball, so I don't know what this is. <sighs> now, my last finished object was an experiment. I made myself a watch band for this flamingo watch that my mom got me. The original watch band just kind of died. It just fell apart and I ordered a new one that was supposed to fit and it didn't and I had spent too much money on it and it just kind of pissed me off. So I salvaged the hardware from it and just wove a new band. I just looped some yarn over the pegs here, wove it, used this as a counterweight, tensioned it on my hands, took the buckle off. Um, you know, I am a novice weaver. I don't have any kind of a loom or anything. So I did have to use glue to seal down the edges, which I'm not super happy about, but that was the only way I could stop them from frying. So this is a project that I'm going to revisit at some point, but right now I'm just happy that I can wear my watch again because I kind of missed it. Okay, so that is it for finished objects. Um, oh, well, not quite. We have one transitionary item. So this is the Hermione's Everyday Sock I'm making for my editor, and I... Uh, finished this one while I was at work. This is Stroll in Chocolate Cherry. Oh, the watch band. This is um, just some leftover yarn I had. I don't know what it's called. It's just sock yarn. Um, sorry, not, this isn't Chocolate Cherry. It's Cordial, um, but it's kind of Chocolate Cherry colors, like browns and reds. And so that is sock number one. And I have a start on sock number two. And Hermione's Everyday Socks are my favorite sock pattern. They're the basis for my own vanilla sock recipe that I use all the time. Um, I've made like eight pairs of these over the years and I'm not a person who typically repeats patterns. So absolutely love those. We have 
a small update on the Eleonora project. I'm not going to take these out of the holders because that's just a pain, but I am starting on the leg. You can see a little bit more of the texture pattern here. Um, and I did like four rows so far this weekend. So I'm trying to do one pattern repeat, which is four rows. Um, every time I sit down to do it or half a repeat, um, it doesn't always happen that way, especially with this week. This is just, it's so small and fiddly that I really need to be undisturbed. I need to have good lighting and it's just not something that I can just, you know, pull out and work on while I'm watching a movie. I mean, I do watch movies when I'm working on it, but the circumstances have to be right. And then the last item that I have is the French Vanilla, which I haven't done a whole lot to it. There's the stitch marker from last time. That's where we are here. This is a self-drafted setter pattern for a design collection I'm working on. I'm still not thrilled with it, but I'm just trying to get it off the needles at this point because I want to cast on something else, but I also don't want to have this lingering and I really don't want to stick it in timeout again because it was in timeout for like a year or so. I just want to get it done. So that's it on the, uh, the knitting front. Um, so let's take a moment and do our sponsorship break before we move on to the next segments because it's my podcast and I'm sponsoring it. So I just wanted to give a shout out to all of my wonderful Patreons or Patreon members. Uh, as many of you know, I am working on a short story collection once we hit our first patron goal, which is listed on the Patreon website. You can see all of the things that we are working toward. Um, also, when I hit that goal, I will start posting um, Patreon members' usernames at the end of podcasts and in my books. I just want to get a few more people signed up before I start doing that. Um, so I'm working towards that. Uh, they've had some exclusive blog posts go up recently, as well as some advanced content that will be appearing on my blog. Um, they've had some recent polls where they help me decide on the names of things. They're helping me work out the pattern right now. So there's all kinds of cool stuff going on over there but I can't make it cooler until we get more people. That's the frustrating bit. Um, so if you are at all interested, you can go over there. You can just follow me for a while to get a feel for things. I do post some public content over there. Um, or you can just dive right in and sign up for a dollar a month. So either way, that would be super cool and helpful to me, to the podcast, to my books, to my design content, and you know, also to the fluffy darlings that are and are always interrupting the podcast. So have a look over there um, and please consider signing up. Our shout out this week goes to the podcast Historically Haunted, which is available on Spotify and Google Podcasts. It's an audio only. Um, this is a podcast that I really like because it looks at several different aspects of the creepy stuff. So it starts out with um, a cryptid moment where Ariel, the host, talks about different creatures from around the world. And they always tie into the main segment at the end of the podcast, which is about a historical haunting. So in the episode I just listened to, she was talking about um, Marie Laveau and Louisiana, New Orleans. So the cryptid she did was a Louisiana specific creature that lives in the swamps. She is also doing um, a little moment where she goes over some of the tech that ghost hunters use, which is kind of cool. And she explains how it works and the theories behind why it's used in ghost hunting. So I thought that was really interesting and a very unique take on the genre. 
Um, so please go check out Ariel and Historically Haunted. So what I am reading and watching right now, um, my audiobook is called Rough Crossings, and it's about the role of black soldiers and civilians and slavery before, during, and immediately after the American Revolution. And specifically, it's looking at things on the British side of things and the enslaved people who joined the British army because they were promised freedom. And uh, some of the rewards that they were given and how even that payment was not really equal or what they were promised or what they expected. So it can be very tough, very heartbreaking in places, but it also is a very important book, I believe. Um, and it kind of looks at how the American Revolution set the stage for abolition in the Civil War later on. So that one is really good. I'm almost done with it. And then the uh, ebook I'm reading right now is just called Votes for Women. And I very, very stupidly did not write down the author. Um, but it, it is what it says on the cover. It's just a look at the women's rights movement. Specifically right now I'm reading about Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Study Canton. And... Did I say that right? I think I <laughs> merged her last names. Elizabeth Caddy Stanton. Okay. Um, so I'm reading about the two of them. We're up to like the 1860s, 1870s right now. And some of it is rehashing stuff that I already knew. Um, some of it is new information or a new angle on that information. Um, so if you are interested in women's rights and the history of women's rights in the United States, that is a good one to pick up. Um, as for what I'm watching, uh, Ash and I sat down and rewatched Enola Holmes last night, which is still excellent. I still love it. Um, one thing that we really liked about it is there's this scene where she puts on a, a costume, a disguise, and she has to wear a corset for the first time. And she mentions that it's, you know, considered restrictive and uh, it subjugates women, which that was an opinion at this point in the 1800s. A lot of progressive people did feel that way. Um, it wasn't a universal opinion, but for her character, it makes sense. And then she tries it on, but she doesn't have that immediate, oh, I can't breathe, I'm going to faint. Because as someone who does wear corsets occasionally, they can be very comfortable. And if your corset is uncomfortable, it means that either it's incorrectly laced or it doesn't fit you correctly. So it was really great to see her wearing it, still doing all of these really athletic things and not being like fainting and, you know, railing about how horrible it is because they can be extremely useful garments. So I really love that. I just love Enola Holmes in general. There's a second one coming out later this year, which I'm excited for. So really enjoyed that one. Um, the two ongoing series I'm watching right now are Sailor Moon Crystal. I'm on season three, which is where we get the Outer Senshi, which I love. Um, I absolutely adore Sailor Moon. It's how I met Ash and how we met some of our best friends from high school. In fact, the three of us all have, if I can get that on camera, we all have Sailor Moon themed tattoos. Um, they're all a little bit different. They're all in different places, but it, it means a lot to me. And I feel like the crystal version just really corrects a lot of the things that were wrong with the original. Um, it just, oh, it's so perfect. I love Sailor Moon Crystal. Um, and then I'm also watching the Cecil Hotel documentary um, about Eliza, 
Elisa, I think it's Elisa, Elisa Lamb, that went missing there. And I didn't realize that the whole series was about her. I thought that the series was about the events at the Cecil Hotel in general. So that has been really interesting. I'm only on episode two, and I think there are four episodes in the series, if I remember correctly. So that's been really interesting. And if you are interested in true crime or the Elisa Lamb case, then uh, please do go watch it because it's got a lot of information that I hadn't heard before. Hey guys, it's voiceover Sheena. I'm um, doing a second take for our news section this week. I just wasn't happy with the way that it came out, especially in light of recent events. So first of all, I just wanted to acknowledge what's happening in Ukraine. My heart aches for everyone who's being impacted by this. War is so fucking pointless and particularly this one which I could go on a whole rant about this but I'm going to avoid doing that here um and I know that as makers it, uh making things for those in need that's our love language that's how we show support and I just wanted to remind everybody that you can knit all the sweaters, socks, blankets that you want, but especially if you are a distance away, the most helpful thing that you can do to make sure that the right kind of support gets to where it's needed is to donate cash. Um, use the reputable charity of your choice. My preferred is Doctors Without Borders or Médecins Sans, Sans Frontières. Um, the Red Cross is also a good option. There are plenty of other charities out there collecting money, and that money can go towards things like food, medical supplies, sanitary needs, as well as things like clothing. So I just wanted to remind you of that. If you do want to knit for people in need, there are plenty of other charities out there, including some that help the homeless, um, if you just Google charity knitting or look for charity knitting on Ravelry, you'll find so many groups. Um, I myself am a member of Hats and More for War Torn Syria, which provides hand knit items for people living in refugee camps because hand knits are requested for those people because they hold up better and are easier to care for in those situations. So make sure that you're doing your research and finding the best charity and the best method of support for Aww. you. Um, and again, I am just so sorry for anyone who is having to deal with this right now. It's horrible and I wish that there was more that I could do to help you all. Now, moving on to some slightly more cheerful news for our knit tea section. I did just want to give a quick boost to the Center for Knit and Crochet. They're looking for two new board members. It's a volunteer position to help with things like grant applications, program planning, collections management, um, and all sorts of things along those lines. You can check out their website, which will be linked below for more information. MDK has also released its first yarn line intended to offset their carbon footprint. It's a very pretty line. It's called Atlas. Um, I'm not totally clear on how exactly the yarn line offsets their carbon footprint, but they do have several posts about it on their website, which is moderndailyknitting.com. Crochet has recently been popping up all over, including collections at Target and Sue Lily and in the Olympic bouquets they handed out this year, which were all hand crocheted cashmere. Um, you know, the reps from China all said that this was done in the name of sustainability, which left the rest of the world scratching their heads and wondering if they actually know what the word sustainability means. Um, but, you know, just keep in mind that crochet cannot be done by machine. It has to be done by hand. So that means that usually sweatshop labor is involved in producing these crocheted items for the mass market. So do keep that in mind and expect to pay higher prices when things are handmade. 
um, unless you enjoy supporting people who work for pennies a day. So just something to keep in mind there. And in the tea section of Knit Tea, a couple of tech dude bros have purchased the URL knitting.com or the domain and are setting it up as a e-commerce business that is meant to show people how marketing works. Now, apparently they are going to be showing or selling things like patterns and yarns through the website. There's a lot of question from the knitting community about this because they obviously know absolutely nothing about the community and did not do their research ahead of time. And now when knitters are pointing this out, they're saying that they're being bullied. Now, I'm not saying that they aren't. I'm usually someone who believes the victim. But in this case, they seem to be calling people pointing out their bullshit as bullying. And yeah, I have seen the young community get pretty nasty. It's entirely possible that someone is being vicious in emails or DMs or blog posts or whatever. But this seems to be a case of someone crying wolf. And right now, the biggest or the best advice that I have seen is don't engage, just sit back with your popcorn and your knitting and watch these guys flounder because it's clearly not going to last very long the way they're going. So thank you for joining me tonight and thank you so much to my patrons who make all of this possible. Please like, comment, subscribe, or share, and I hope that you are all safe and healthy and have something cute and fluffy to cuddle with. Ciao.